Good morning. I'm glad to be with you today in our discussion of Lucy Webb Hayes. She's absolutely one of my favorites in, in terms of the entire class because of the personality that I see come forth in her biographical information. But also she lends herself, her life lends itself very well to our thesis about the course. She is a biblical helpmeet to her husband. And unfortunately, history has taken hold of her and has transformed her into a different kind of role model. And hopefully we can spend just a few minutes today talking about that and disassembling it if we can. Lucy was born on August 28, 1831 in Chillicothe, Ohio, to I think a very financially fortunate home. Our parents were Dr. James and Maria Webb. And I believe that she had many advantages, some um, probably far beyond some of our first ladies. She had many advantages in life, not the least of which is she was the first to have graduated with what you and I understand as a full degree, a full college degree. Now, some of the other first ladies had been off to finishing schools, to some college work, and that's very important. But the degree that we understand, um, she is the first to have matriculated all the way through and earned that degree. She graduated from the Westland Female College in Cincinnati. So Cincinnati is kind of a hub of education, business, and banking, and she's right there. I want to talk a little bit about her life and then we're, um, you know, as she was growing up and then we'll move on to her role as First Lady. Her family and the family of her future husband, Rutherford B. Hayes, knew one another. And as a matter of fact, I believe that uh, the mothers and certainly Rutherford's sister, Fanny, began matchmaking uh, when, when uh, Lucy was quite, quite young, still a teenager. And initially, by any source that you look at, Rutherford was not interested in her. She was the girl next door, too young, cute as a button, but just not, you know, didn't, didn't tickle his fancy. But later in life when they met, she had aged a little bit. He, he thought, she's the one for me. And by all accounts, they had a tremendously successful marriage. And um, I, I think that the success that he did enjoy in the White House, which was not a great deal, the success that he did enjoy was due to the strength of their marriage. The Republican Party at the time of Hayes' presidency was sort of in a, in, involved in its own civil war. We can talk about that for just a second. Uh, and the nation was just trying to decide what it was going to be in those tumultuous post-war years. So let's talk a little bit about Lucy and her White House years. And to understand her and what she brought, we're going to have to look at the times a little bit. First of all, on the negative side, I have to say this. The election of 1876 was the most controversial up to that point. And I don't think we had another one like it until the election of 2000. I believe I've mentioned this in another lecture. We won't have another um, so deeply hotly contested because there was so much at stake. Rutherford B. Hayes, I believe, from the, the, the historical record supports unquestionably that he was personally a man of character and personal honor. Um, and Grant, his predecessor, I do not feel in any way that he was rotten to the core, but he was surrounded by people who were and his administration, his, both of his administrations, the two terms that he served, suffered terribly. And Hayes, I think, has better judgment. He was someone who was a patriot like Grant, didn't have the drinking issues that Grant did, and I, and I say that unjudgmentally, um, just a fact. And he had, I think, you know, a very stable family life like, like Grant. But the two men had different worldviews, and Hayes came into the White House under a dark shadow, unfortunately, um, through little fault of his own. And his plans for cleaning up, cleaning up in terms of uh, appointments, administration, the way things were done, 
using the White House offices and cabinet offices uh, on the up and up and most honest ways, those things were undermined by the controversial nature of the election. And I'm sure if you go back and look in your notes with Dr. Justice's class and some of the other coursework that you've had, you'll see, um, he may have talked about this in the presidency as well, as well, you'll see that, you know, this was a terrible divisive election, not only between North and South and their respective candidates, Democrat and Republican, but also the Republican Party within itself. The Republican Party was divided by those who wanted to reform and those who did not. And that's very sad. I don't think that'll really be settled until the age of McKinley and more importantly, the age of Teddy Roosevelt. And, you know, there's disputed election returns. There are votes that are supposedly not counted. As a matter of fact, at the University of Florida, my best friend did some research on some votes that were not counted from Archer, Florida, a community right outside of Gainesville. And they would have gone towards the Democratic candidate, Tilden. And all of this went through all of the constitutional, you know, this election went through all of the constitutional hoops to try to settle it. And more or less, it was settled by as men in a smoke-filled room. And there was supposedly uh, an understanding that if the Democrats would stop pushing for uh, the Southern or the, the Democratic candidate, Samuel J. Tilden, that in fact Reconstruction would come to an end. Now, Reconstruction did come to an end, and unfortunately, I believe that, gosh, how do we say this, that it was seen as if Hayes was part of a dirty deal, a backroom deal, and I just don't see him in that light, and I don't think the record supports that, but he can't ever come out from under that. He was known as rather fraud Hayes and his fraudulency uh, and it's just unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. And we had to endure a great deal of that. I remember in the election of 2000 when Hillary Clinton said that, um, you know, that the Supreme Court selected George W. Bush. It was just a mess. It was just a mess. And very few newspapers would go back and report that once a final recount was done in South Florida, that it was unquestionably a Bush victory. You won't see that anywhere, even though it's true. Um, it was, I think, in the Miami, the Miami Herald had it like on page seven in the bottom under somebody car dealership advertisement that, oh yeah, by the way, he did win um, by a large margin. So, in terms of those undisputed votes, so politics are never clear. They're never like glass. They're always um, hazy and dusty, and unfortunately, the way the election goes can sometimes cover color what a president is able to do. Hayes wanted reform. He wanted reform uh, particularly with regard to civil service. And if we were doing the presidency class, we would see this issue continue. Um, civil service is simply the idea of if you hold a government job of any type, then you should be, um, you should merit it. You should have qualifications for it, not these not be just appointments for your political flunkies. Uh, he wanted uh, the gold standard to lower um, uh, taxes, all kinds of things. Um, he was a good businessman's candidate in many ways, but there were those who didn't want to relinquish control of the party to legislation that would limit discretion on the part of appointments and decisions made. So it's just a mess. One of the other elements that, that Rutherford wanted to see change was he wanted the White House to not necessarily be a place where a lot of money was spent on alcohol. He felt that the Grant administration was one that was just colored by um, parties and free-flowing alcohol, not just with the president himself, but just in general. And let's have a different image for the first family. And Lucy supported this. Now, this is a time when temperance unions are really getting some steam. And I could talk about this all day long. I think Dr. Justice talks quite a bit about this in his courses. Where there were women who were really 
using uh, their, I won't say power, but they were using what influence they did have to stand up for the family and to stand up for the Im implementation of laws to limit alcohol use. There were too many uh, providers within a family who were drinking away whatever they earned. So, I mean, um, this wasn't just a religious movement. It was part, it was um, in part a religious movement, but there were those too on the outside of the churches who saw alcohol as, as you know, driving, you know, a wedge between our nation's family members and their ability to provide. So having said that, the, these times did have a growing temperance movement and Lucy supported that. Rutherford was the one now you'll see some dispute in political, I mean, in historical sources, but Rutherford is the one who actually is going to come up with the idea of let's not serve alcohol in the White House. Um, and certain high polluting circumstances where there were dignitaries from other nations who, particularly European nations, where wine is just a part of their everyday table, you know, that would be a different thing, but there's not going to be... Um, the hard liquor, there's not going to be party after party after party where it's served and dinner after dinner. And part of the reason, to be very frank with you, is it was a way for him to financially be a little more thrifty with his own purse. If you understand this, um, even today, the president, it comes, the paying for uh, entertainment comes out of his own pocket. It's not a gift to the White House or being in that station. And Lucy... Lucy supports this and, and for all reasons. And unfortunately, she had been labeled, and this probably happened, I, I think most sources will support this idea, the term Lemonade Lucy did not come about while the Hayes were in the, Oval, were in the White House, but rather later, looking back on her, she was labeled derisively Lemonade Lucy. I think you'll find, and we've talked about this before, I think you'll find that anytime there is an effort to uh, demonstrate any morality or any any dignity um, and, and divorcing yourself from the cave dwellers and the Hollywood element in this century, then you're ridiculed. Um, we, we saw that. We saw that tremendously with uh, the Bush, Bush um, 43. We saw that terribly. And here it is again. But in the White House, Lucy is going to do her best to, to make this policy one that can be, you know, easily dealt with. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Lucy had a soft spot in her heart before she was in the White House and during her years in the White House for orphans, for um, veterans of the war on both sides. And she will entertain and do fundraising dinners to help with these causes. She also had a very strong attachment to the young people of the, the D.C. area, and she wanted to show them that there could be entertainment and activities to enjoy without alcohol. She would have, uh, there was a billiards room. I want to be careful how I explain this. There was a billiards room in the White House a pool, a large pool table, and back in this day, and I think even in some quarters today, there's a little bit of that, but sometimes billiards and pool were equated with, you know, uh, drinking, unsavory characters, and she doesn't get rid of the billiards, the pool table or the billiards table, she just puts it off to the side, and in the billiards room, she turns that into, or more or less, an atrium she will fashion, use the windows to be uh, a place where she can grow flowers on the inside during the inclement times of the year. And that's, I think to me, that's just amazing. And the flowers that she grows there and in the gardens outside, she and the young people will take and distribute to hospitals, to places where uh, veterans are living who can't take care of themselves. And again, this is one of those stories that becomes little known, but it is it is bringing some beauty and functionality to the White House that it hadn't seen in a while. She also would have dinners for the young people. As I told you, she has a great fondness for them. She would have dinners for young people 
and she would, rather than serving alcohol, she did serve lemonade, but she would put crushed sweetened strawberries in the lemonade and have the tables festooned with the flowers that, that they had raised in the White House gardens to show them that they can have a lovely time, an engaging time, without the alcohol being served. And that just, to me, that is just a tremendous, she's a tremendous asset to her husband in that regard. And she makes, she, she turns, turns the direction. And again, I'm, I'm not criticizing President Grant and I'm not criticizing um, by any means, I'm not criticizing his wife and her entertaining. It's just a different take on entertaining and expenditure. So um, I, I love that about Lucy. She lived a Christian life by example, and um, she felt that their role in the White House should be used to promote moral, religious, and educational influences. The value of education, the value of living a moral life, the value of religious training, her first reception was on St. Patrick's Day of 1877. There was no green beer. She had cabinet wives and their nieces attend and help, and it was very, very popular. She had a lot of young people come, and um, I, I think that's marvelous. And she was a hit in that regard, at least for uh, initially she was. She was very interested in the history of the White House, and she loved living there. And she saw it as the people's house and one that should be revered for all of the history that it represented. Congress didn't uh, vote funds for repairs that needed to be done until the end of Hayes term. So she spent money on replacing um, the, the billiard room that I told you about with her greenhouse, the atrium. She did that out of her own pocket. Um, she will hire also an arranger, a florist, a floral arranger um, to help their projects. They're what we would call mission projects. They help with their projects with the flowers and, and things on that order. This, this White House was really modernized um, as because everything around it was becoming modernized. There will be running water throughout it. She'll be the first to have a typewriter. There will be an early telephone. And she will be one of the first photograph owners. Now, I tell you that uh, for this reason. Because she, she lived in this time when there was a lot of technological innovation. Just think about when, you, when the White House first had um, Wi-Fi or first had a color television or first had a dishwasher or things like that. She was pegged as the new woman, a modern woman who represented, um, you know, women's issues and women's rights. And there was a growing movement for women seeking the vote. And here she is. She's got all this power and this modernity at her hands, and she is going to be the one to... Um, take women into the next century. And that's not Lucy at all. That's not Lucy at all. And I want to provide with you um, what I think is support for that interpretation. She had been heavily courted by Elizabeth Cady Stanton um, about, you know, women's voting rights, and they wanted her to jump on board and to be the public face for that, and she respectfully declined. No. I don't want to do that. Even her beloved Women's Christian Temperance Union had placed, who had placed water fountains all over the country um, as a way of, um, gosh, how can I say this? If you can get something to drink without having to buy uh, beer or ale or something like that. And President Hayes graciously declined when they made an offer to put one um, on the White House lawn. They both believe that it would lead to ridicule um, and, you know, sort of bring to under the microscope, once again, this idea that he didn't serve alcohol, so you have a water fountain, and that it would create more controversy. He said, you know, thank you very much for wanting to include Mrs. Hayes in on this worthy endeavor, 
and he said, if you want to do something as a tribute to Lucy, and really that's sort of what they had in mind was, you know, taking this, this stance, you know, to a logical conclusion, having water fountain. But, you know, and, and Lucy had become, the, whether she wanted to or not, had become the face of the alcohol policy, even though it was really her husband's more than hers. But, you know, he said, why don't you commission a portrait of her? Um, and you will, you know, we have beautiful portraits of the first ladies um, going back quite a ways. Um, but this, I think she has one of the first of the great portraits that we understand. Now, Lucy herself wasn't particularly happy with this idea. And the picture you're looking at now is the finished portrait of Lucy that was done in her honor. Uh, she said, I would rather be enshrined in the people's heart. But enthusiasm on all in all quarters grew for this project. So it is now going to be um, a done deal. It is going to be painted by Daniel Huntington. And the, late, the Young Men's Christian Association will also uh, take part in terms of raising money to pay this artist. And uh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful painting, I think, that captures the loveliness of her spirit as well as her dress and her hair and her face. It just catches, captures her. Um, a few, uh, but again, she's not looking, in both of these instances, she's still not looking for... A modern cause. She is not looking to be part of the changes in women's roles. She just happens to live at a time when some conveniences are coming online, when technology, is, when is technology not going to be, when technology is on the move, when women, anytime after a war, you'll see that women and um, in the 20th century minorities they have participated in defending their cause, their nation, and they feel that they have a sense of, they have earned more of a role in decision-making by the government. So here it is. We see that most keenly after World War II with both minority votes and women who see themselves, you know, they, they have the right to vote, but they are still you know, have different roles in culture than we will see. And they see this as a time when America needs to start recognizing their contribution and their value. And there's a little bit of that going on here. And I think that really gives rise to this women's suffrage movement. And it's going to take until 1919 for the Constitution to be amended, as you know. Um, but here it's really going. But Lucy doesn't want to be part of that. That's not what she feels either her role is and or or her her worldview. Now, her sister-in-law Fanny, to whom she was very close, and they named their daughter Fanny after her. Um, and uh, young Fanny, the daughter, was growing up in the White House and uh, had a wonderful time during these years. I think they even made a couple of beautiful dollhouses for her. But but her namesake, uh, Rutherford's sister Fanny was very much the advocate, the someone who, who wanted to be involved in the change of women's roles. And, and I think that history, looking back in their portrayal of Mrs. Hayes, Mrs. Lucy Hayes, in this role, they're actually looking at maybe uh, Fanny, or thinking that because they were, Fanny and Lucy were so close, that surely Lucy would have those same views but it's not, and I, um, I have several, several sources um, where I'm trying to dig deep, more and more deeply into the life of Lucy. And when you look at survey sources, or when you look at sources that are just, um, how do I want to say, multi, not, uh, not multifaceted, um, that are just sort of, let's take a quick look at her. They portray her and flesh this out in this role as an early advocate of women's interests. She wasn't. If you read an in-depth biography, such as the one I have, First Lady, 
The Life of Lucy Webb Hayes by Emily Abt Gear. You will see, and I, when I send you this video, I will give you the bibliographical information on that. You see a very different woman. You see someone who turned from that, who simply wanted life to be one that pleased God and that pleased her husband and that fulfilled her role um, as a patriotic American wife um, who was trying to help oversee the healing of the nation. I, I hope, as I do with all of these lectures, I hope that hearing what little bit I've had to tell you will encourage you to read more. And maybe even more importantly than that, is it will encourage you to look past the image of an individual that we have from the news media, that we have from popular culture. There might be something actually very different down beneath. And um, here is certainly a good example of that. Well, uh, next time we're going to talk about Teddy Roosevelt and his first wife, Alice, and his second wife, Edith, and we'll enjoy that look, I think. I, I'm running out of time, and what I would like to do is, um, after we talk about the two Mrs. Roosevelt's, do a lecture where I just give you the briefest information about Mrs. Taft, Mrs. Um, Harding, well, excuse me, Mrs. Taft, I forgot the two Mrs. Wilsons, then Mrs. Harding, and um, Mrs. I love Grace Coolidge, and Mrs. Hoover. See if I can get through that in a pretty short order. Uh, with no, uh, they certainly deserve their own lectures. Mrs. Justice has just struck our feet. But anyway, we'll get this set for you, and I hope that you enjoy this a fraction, at least a fraction as much as I have enjoyed talking about her. And I think she'd be very pleased um, that we appreciate her heart as a loving wife and mother.